Hey guys, welcome to another EDH Deck Tech episode brought to you by the Command Valley. I'm your host Landon, and today I'll be taking you through my Brea Ethereum Shaper deck. With Brea being reprinted in Double Masters, I thought it would be a perfect time to make a deck tech for this amazing artifact commander. Hopefully this reprint will lower her price and make her a little bit more accessible for those who are itching to build an artifact deck. On top of Brea being reprinted, there are tons of other artifacts being reprinted in Double Masters which will hopefully lower the cost of the deck. So if you're unfamiliar with Brea, she is a legendary artifact creature human. She costs white, blue, black, red, so every color except for green. And when she enters the battlefield, she makes two 1-1 one, one blue Thopter artifact creature tokens with flying. And she has an activated ability that costs two and sacrificing two artifacts. And you get to choose one of these three options. Either she deals three damage to target player or target creature gets minus four, minus four until end of turn, or you gain five life. Now, if you are familiar with Brea, you'll know that she has quite the reputation for being a very broken, combo-tastic commander that can win games very, very early and seemingly out of nowhere. And she really is a type of commander that you have to implicitly say that you didn't bring that type of Brea deck to the table. She does draw a lot of attention because her entering with two Thopters and her having all of those abilities of which one can actually kill your opponents, she's a very prime target for dumping infinite mana into to close out a game. After trying to brew a couple different lists for her, I just came to the conclusion that she really does want to have infinite mana and be broken and have some type of combo. So that's ultimately what I went with and what this list is. This is a very heavy artifact synergy with four or five different combos that require a couple of moving pieces, which I feel that it's pretty justifiable having a couple of moving pieces. That way you're not winning, you know, on turn three or four. I The way that I built this deck, I, I think it would be very, very difficult to win earlier than turn five, unless you get like a super Christmas dreamland hand. So this deck really isn't looking to win until later on, and it plays a good amount of interaction, and it really is focusing on just having artifact synergy, playing a bunch of artifacts, building up a bunch of Thopters, maybe equipping equipping them with a Skull Clamp and drawing a ton of cards. But yeah, this is not a super competitive deck. It's not trying to win early, but the main win cons of the deck are, are combos. It just, they require a bunch of pieces. So with that super long intro out of the way, let's dive right into the deck. So we are playing a bunch of mana rocks because our curve is relatively high and Brea does cost four different colors. So I wanna make sure that we always have our color. So we're starting off with the signets. We have Azorius signet, is it signet, and Demir signet. So essentially these cost two mana and you can pay one colorless into them tap them and you get two colors out of it. So you can turn your colorless mana into usable colored mana. We're then playing a couple of talismans with Talisman of Conviction, Talisman of Hierarchy, and Talisman of Dominance. These are super efficient, only costing two mana. They can give us one colorless mana or we can pay life and get the color that we need. We're obviously playing Soul Ring, it's an artifact deck. I'd be remiss if it wasn't in here. And we're playing Thought Vessel, which gives us no maximum hand size. We can draw a ton of cards, so that's really nice to have. We're then playing Chromatic Lantern, which can make our lands tap for any color, and it also generates a colored mana when we tap it, so that's super useful in the deck. We're then playing Gilded Lotus, which it does cost 5 mana, but it can tap for 3 of any one color. Really good ramp, and it can help us cast multiple spells in a turn, or maybe even activate Brea. We're then playing Felwar Stone, which is just a really efficient mana rock, it can tap for one color according to what our opponents have in play, super nice. It's almost impossible that there isn't a player at the table that has one of our colors, so that's really nice. And then we're playing a super underrated artifact that I personally really like, it's one of my pet cards, it's Empowered Auto Generator. It enters the battlefield tapped, but you can tap it and put a charge counter on it, and then you add X mana of any one color where X is the number of charge counters on it. So after a couple of turns, this card gets kind of nuts, so it can start tapping for a ton of mana. Another thing to keep in mind is we have a lot of artifact synergy in the deck, so these do more than just give us mana. We can sacrifice them to Brea, or we can sacrifice them to some of our other pieces, or they're gonna trigger some of our other pieces too. So they're also more than just mana rocks in this deck. Next up, let's go over the tutors. So we're not playing a ridiculous amount of tutors, and we're only playing one tutor that costs less than two mana. Um, we need to have these tutors so we can find the pieces that we need to win because like I said in the intro, our win combos require several moving pieces. So let's start off with the creature tutor. So we've got Tribute Mage, which when it enters a battlefield, we can search our library for an artifact that costs two and put it into our hand. Trophy Mage does the same thing except for it has to find a artifact that costs three CMC. And then Trinket Mage does the same thing as the other two, but we get an artifact that costs one. And then we have Goblin Engineer, which I think that this card is also super cool. When it enters the 
the battlefield, we can search our library for any artifact and put it into our graveyard. It then has an activated ability that costs one red to, and tap and sacrifice an artifact. We can return target artifact card with converted mana cost three or less from our graveyard to the battlefield. Believe it or not, a lot of our combo pieces actually cost three or less. So this is a really good card. This can also reanimate us several other artifacts over the course of the game. Super good card. We're then playing Fabricate, which... Let's just search our library for any artifact and put it into our hand. We then have War of Invention, which is a super cool tutor. It's at instant speed and it has improvised, so we can tap artifacts to help cast this spell. And each artifact that we tap, taps for one generic mana. And we get to search our library for an artifact card with CMC X or less and put it right onto the battlefield. So this is a super powerful tutor in our deck. We're then playing Reshape, which as an additional cost to play it, we have to sacrifice an artifact, but we can search our library for an artifact card that costs X or less and put it right into play. So like War of Invention, this will put the artifact that we're tutoring for directly into play, which is super powerful. We're then playing Koldotha Forge Master, which we can tap it and sacrifice three artifacts to search our library for an artifact card and put it right into play. So it is kind of an expensive artifact to cast and that is a pretty steep cost, but it does put the artifact right into play. And then we have Wishclaw Talisman, which enters a battlefield with three wish counters and we can pay one generic mana, tap it and remove a wish counter from it to search our library for any card and put it into our hand. We then have to give Wishclaw Talisman to an opponent but with Brea, we can put the ability on the stack to tutor and we can then sacrifice Wishclaw Talisman to Brea to, you know, use one of her abilities, thus preventing our opponents from getting the Wishclaw Talisman. And we've got tons of other ways in the deck of returning artifacts from our graveyard to the battlefield. So we could use this again and again, and it mitigates against that downside. All right, so we've gone over the tutor. So let's go over the ways we have of digging deeper into our deck with card advantage. So first up, we've got Skull Clamp, probably one of the best artifacts in any artifact deck. It's an equipment that costs one to equip and the equipped creature gets plus one minus one. And whenever the equipped creature dies, we draw two cards. So if we equip the Thopters that Brea makes or any of the other mere tokens or other Thopters that we're gonna be making throughout the game, it'll get the minus one, it'll die and we'll draw two cards. So we're essentially paying only one generic mana to draw two cards, which is ridiculously powerful. Powerful. We're then playing Thopter Spy Network, which is an enchantment that says at the beginning of our upkeep, if we control an artifact, which we always will, we get to put a 1-1 colorless Thopter onto the battlefield, and whenever one or more artifact creatures we control deals combat damage to a player, we can draw a card. With Thopters having flying and with all the other Thopters you're going to be making, we're going to be drawing one card per turn with this, which I think is pretty good. We can also equip those Thopters that it makes with Skull Clamp and it becomes even better. We're then playing Padim, Console of Innovation. He gives all of our artifacts hexproof, which is really powerful. And at the beginning of our upkeep, if we control the artifact with the highest converted mana cost or tied for the highest converted mana cost, we can draw a card. We then have Iker Wellspring, which when it enters the battlefield or is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, we get to draw a card. So with the tutors that require us to sacrifice an artifact, or if we ever want to sacrifice this to Brea, we're going to be drawing an additional card off of that. We're then playing Baleful Strix, which when it enters the battlefield, we get to draw a card, which seems kind of innocuous, but I think it's pretty good. We've got some other ways of recurring artifacts. If we could get this a couple, if we could do this a couple of times throughout the game, I think it's worth it. It's also a pretty good blocker with flying and death touch, so pretty good card. And then probably the second best card draw we have in the deck besides Skull Clamp is Joyra, Weatherlight Captain. She's a legendary creature human artificer and she reads, whenever we cast a historic spell, we draw a card and artifacts are historic. So every time we cast an artifact, we're going to be drawing a card and hopefully drawing us into another artifact that we can then cast drawing even more cards. Joyra is a super powerful engine in this deck. So in addition to drawing cards, we have other ways of digging a little bit deeper into our deck to find the pieces that we need. So we have Drawn from Dreams. It's a sorcery that lets us look at the top seven cards of our library and we get to put two of them directly into our hand. So this is like a, I'm not going to say a worse version of Dig Through Time, but because I think that Drawn from Dreams is actually worth it. So it's a pretty, it's a really good card. We then have Sahili's Directive, which is a super cool spell. It has it's a sorcery with improvise, so we can tap artifacts to pay to help pay for the spell. And we reveal the top X cards of our library, and we can put any number of artifact cards with converted mana cost X or less from among them onto the battlefield. And then the rest of them go into our graveyard, which honestly isn't a huge downside with some of the other recursion pieces that we have. So if we put six or seven into this, we could get a ton of artifacts into play. We then have Mystic Forge, which is an artifact that lets us look at the top card of our library at any time, and we can cast the top card of our library as long as it's an artifact or a colorless non-land card. We're really just focusing on the artifact spells, 
this is going to turn the top card of our library into basically being in our hand. We can also pay one life and tap it to exile the top card of our library if there's a dead card on top or a land that we don't need that will help us, you know, maybe dig a little bit deeper to find what we're looking for. We're then playing Duretti, Scrap Savant. He is a planeswalker that has a plus two loyalty ability that says discard up to two cards, then draw that many cards. He then has a minus loyalty ability that costs two that says sacrifice an artifact, and if you do, return target artifact card from your graveyard to the battlefield. So this is one of the ways that I was talking about that we have of recurring artifacts from our graveyard directly into play. His minus 10 says you get an emblem with whenever an artifact is put into your graveyard from the battlefield, return that card to the battlefield at the beginning of the next end step. Super powerful emblem. I don't know if we'll ever get to that point. 10 loyalty is a lot, especially since we're probably going to be using his minus abilities, but still super great card. In addition to mana rocks, we also have some other ways in our deck of making our spells a little bit easier to cast. So we've got Chief Engineer, which is a creature that gives all of our artifact spells Convoke, so we can actually tap our creatures to pay for our artifact spells. We then have Foundry Inspector, which is an artifact creature that makes all of our artifact spells cost one less to cast, and Ethereum Sculptor is essentially the same thing. So with these out, our mana rocks are significantly reduced, and these are going to generate a ton of value for us over the game with how many artifacts we're casting, so they're super good to have. We then have Master Transmuter, which is one of those cards that is being reprinted in Double Masters, and it was also reprinted in Mystery Boosters. Before, it was a pretty expensive card. Now it's getting to be pretty budget, and I'm super happy about it. It's an artifact creature that has an activated ability that says pay blue tap it and return an artifact we control to its owner's hand and we can put an artifact from our hand directly into play so we can trade we can trade up really big with a thopter for a massive artifact spell we've got a couple of those that we can go that i'm going to be going over later but this also lets us put artifacts out at instant speed which is pretty cool it also makes them pseudo counterproof because our opponents can't counter us putting them directly into play. We then have Storm the Vault, which I also find to be super underrated and I was really surprised at how cheap it was. It's a legendary enchantment that reads, whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, make a treasure. And then at the beginning of our end step, if we control five or more artifacts, we then flip it over into a Vault of Ketlakin. It's a legendary land that has two mana producing abilities. The first one adds one mana of any color, and the second part is add one blue to your mana pool for each artifact you control. If that looks familiar, that's because that is literally Telerian Academy, which is banned in Commander. So this is a super powerful land, and like I said, I'm really surprised that it's not more expensive than it is, because in our deck, it is not difficult to have five artifacts at the end of our turn. All right, so now the moment you've been waiting for, we're going to go over the combos. So we've got five combos in the deck um, that I know of. I know that sounds really dumb, but like, there might be another combo in there that I haven't seen yet, but these are the five ones that I put in intentionally. First one is Thopter Foundry plus Sword of the Meek plus Ashnod's Altar. And Ashnod's Altar is going to be a recurring card when it comes to combos. It is one of the main combo pieces that we have. So, so how this combo works is with Thopter Foundry, Sword of the Meek, and Ashnod's Altar all on the table, we activate Thopter Foundry, paying the one generic mana, sacrificing the Sword of the Meek. What that is going to do is put Sword of the Meek into the graveyard, and we're going to make a blue Thopter token, and we're going to gain a life. When the 1-1 one -one enters the battlefield, Sword of the Meek will trigger from our graveyard, and it will return to the battlefield equipped to that Thopter. What we can do next is sacrifice the Thopter to the Ashnod's Altar, making two mana. With one of that mana, we will activate the Thopter Foundry again, sacrificing the Sword of the Meek, making another Thopter, and returning the Sword of the Meek into play. So that's a loop. We're netting one generic mana each time because the Thopter that we are sacrificing to Ashnod's Altar is giving us two mana, and we only need one mana to activate the Thopter Foundry. So this gains us infinite mana and infinite life. This doesn't necessarily end the game on the spot, but if we have another card called Disciple of the Vault, whenever a artifact we control is put into the graveyard, a uh, target opponent is going to lose a life. That will kill all of our opponents. That's an optional piece to the combo. I think having infinite mana and infinite life is also really good. So that's combo A. Combo B is Nim Death Mantle plus Ashnod's Altar plus any creature that enters the battlefield with two or more tokens. So we're going to just stick with Brea. We are playing a couple of other artifacts that make tokens when they enter the battlefield, but I'll talk about those in a minute. Brea enters the battlefield with two tokens. So how this works is with Ashnod's Altar, Brea, and Nim Death Mental all in the battlefield, we will sacrifice Brea and we'll just say both Thopters for now to the Ashnod's Altar, adding six colorless to our mana pool. 
Nim Death Mantle will see Brea dying and it will ask us if we want to pay 4 mana to return Brea to the battlefield with the Nim Death Mantle attached to it. At that point we will pay the 4 mana, returning Brea, and when she enters she'll make 2 more tokens, and we'll effectively have gained 2 mana. Every time we do this, we will be gaining more and more mana, and we can do this until we have infinite mana, and once we've gained infinite mana, we can just start sacrificing Brea and one Thopter, so we're netting infinite Thopters. We can then dump the infinite mana into Brea, sacrificing the infinite Thopters to ping our opponents to death. Again, this combo will also be deadly if we have Disciple of the Vault in play. Seeing all those things die, we can just ping our opponents to death. Combo D is Ashnod's Altar plus Brea plus Eldrazi Displacer. So how this one works is with Eldrazi Displacer, Ashnod's Altar, and Brea in play, we sacrifice two creatures to the Ashnod's Altar, making four colorless mana. We can either sacrifice the Thopters that Brea made or any other art, any other creature that we have. We put three of that four mana into Eldrazi Displacer's ability that lets us exile another creature we control and immediately return it to the battlefield. So we target Brea, she re-enters, we'll get two more artifacts that we can then sacrifice to the Eldrazi Displacer and do this again. Each time that we do this, we are netting one generic mana. If we do this infinite times, have infinite mana in our mana pool, we can then just start blinking Brea without having to sacrifice the Thopters. This way we get the infinite Thopters and we can dump that infinite mana into Brea, sacrificing our infinite Thopters, thus winning the game. Combo C requires Pilipala and Grand Architect. These last two combos are the two combos in the deck that do not require Ashnod's Altar to win. So how this one wins, and this one's a little bit more difficult because we have to have Pilipala on the table for a full turn cycle because um, it, it will have summoning sickness, but Pilipala has a really cool ability. It costs two and we have to untap it and we can add one mana of any mana to our mana pool. Grand Architect says we can pay one blue mana and turn a creature blue. We can then tap an untapped blue creature we control to add two mana to our mana pool. We can only spend this mana to cast artifact spells or activate abilities of artifacts. So what we're going to do is turn Pilipala blue once it doesn't have summoning sickness and tap it with Grand Architect. This will give us two generic mana into our mana pool. We then put that mana into Pilipala, untapping it, adding one mana of whatever color we want to our mana pool. We can then tap Pilipala again with the Grand Architect making two mana putting it back into Pilipala, untapping it, making a blue mana. So what uh, this is doing is we are getting infinite mana of whatever color we want. And so we can cast our commander once we have the infinite mana, and Brea is an artifact. She can actually sacrifice herself to her activated ability. So we can sacrifice her infinite times and dealing infinite damage to our opponents. And finally, we have the Time Sieve Thopter Assembly combo. And I really like this combo. I think it's really cool that not a whole lot of decks can actually pull this off. You have to be a at least blue black artifact deck and Brea is blue and black. So I think it's super cool and unique to Brea. And how this one works is Time Sieve is a super powerful artifact that has been reprinted and is a lot cheaper. We can tap it and sacrifice five artifacts to take an extra turn after this one. Thopter Assembly says, at the beginning of our upkeep, if we control no Thopters other than Thopter Assembly, we can return Thopter Assembly to our hand and we make five Thopters. We can then tap Time Sieve, sacrifice the five Thopters, and we will gain an extra turn. Before the end of this turn though, we're going to want to recast Thopter Assembly, that way at the beginning of our next turn, we will make five more Thopters. Grant, if we don't have any, we might have to do some sacrificing with Brea just to make sure we don't have any of the Thopters so that this triggers, but at the beginning of the next turn, Thopter Assembly will bounce itself back to our hand, giving us five more Thopters that we can then tap and sacrifice to Time Sieve. So this is going to give us infinite turns, and this doesn't necessarily win us the game, but we are if our opponents don't have any interaction, we are going to draw into our other combo pieces and win the game. So thank you for bearing with me as I explain all five of those combos. I hope that those made sense. If I wasn't super clear on any of them, feel free to let me know down in the comment section. I'll try to respond to them and maybe give some clarification. But uh, I feel like at first glance, this does feel like a lot of combos, but a lot of these combos, they do require a lot of pieces and there is a lot of points in time during each of these combos where our opponents can disrupt it. And a lot of these combos get hated out by certain stacks pieces or other abilities. So I feel like it's, it's okay to have this many combos. All right, so for the last two categories of the deck, I'm going to go over the token makers, the interaction, and the ways we have of recurring things. So we've got trash for treasure, which an additional, as an additional cost, we have to sacrifice an artifact and then we can return an artifact from our graveyard to the battlefield. 
We then have Goblin Welder, which has a ton of words on it. And what it does is we tap it and we choose target artifact, a player controls and target artifact card in that player's graveyard. If both targets are still legal, as this ability resolves, that player simultaneously sacrifices the artifact and returns the artifact card to the battlefield, essentially switching an artifact on our side of the board for an artifact in our graveyard. So we can turn a Thopter into one of our combo pieces or another important artifact. We then have Scrap Trawler, which whenever Scrap Trawler or another artifact we control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, we can return an artifact that costs less than it to our hand from our graveyard. So it's a really good piece. And Dance of the Mance, which it's a sorcery that says return up to X target artifact and or non or enchantment cards, each with converted mana cost X or less from our graveyard to the battlefield. If X is six or more, those permanents are four, four creatures in addition to their other types. So if we have a bunch of artifacts in our graveyard and some extra mana lying around, we can cast this and turn our mana rocks into four, four creatures, which can also be a win con. And then up next, we've got the token maker. So we've got Whirler Rogue and Mirror Battlesphere. Uh, when it when Mirror Battlesphere enters the battlefield, it's going to create four colorless Mirror Artifact creature tokens. So this is another good target for the Nim Deathmantle combo. And Whirler Rogue, when it enters the battlefield, is going to make is going to make two Thopters, which is another piece in the Nim Deathmantle combo. For some if we don't have access to Brea for some reason, we then have Psy Master Thopters and Marodin Besieged. Um, each of these cards, whenever we cast an artifact spell, we're going to make a token. Marodin Besiege does have another, we, when it enters the battlefield, we can choose Mirren or Phyrexian. If we choose Mirren, we'll make a token every time we cast an artifact spell. If we choose Phyrexian at the beginning of our end step, we draw a card and discard a card. And then if there are 15 or more artifact cards in our graveyard, target opponent loses the game. I like the first ability more. The second ability is kind of cute. Maybe you'll pull it off once, but it's really in here for that first ability. And Psy has an activated ability. We can pay one under blue, sacrifice two artifacts, draw a card. Pretty good, but he is so good at making tokens and that's why he's in the deck. All right, and finally, let's go over the interaction because we can't expect our opponents just to kill over and die. So we've got some we've got some ways of dealing with what our opponents are doing. So we've got Swords to Plowshares and Dispatch. Each of which are one mana, instant speed, exile a creature, dispatch, we have to have metalcraft, but it's really not hard for us to have three artifacts in this deck, so it's basically a one mana, exile target creature. We're then playing counterspell, I mean we're in blue, we might as well be playing counterspell, I can stop a board wipe, it can stop somebody removing Brea or one of our combo pieces. We're then playing a couple board wipes, we don't want to be overrun with tokens, and we've got ways of recurring things from our graveyard, so we've got Wrath of God, Supreme Verdict, Merciless Eviction, and Blasphemous Act. And if Supreme Verdict is a little over budget, it is pretty expensive. I think Time Wipe is a really good substitution. We can bounce one of our creatures back to our hand that we don't want to have die, and we can wipe the board and maybe redeploy our stuff. So Time Wipe is also a really good board wipe if, if Supreme Verdict is just a little bit too expensive. I totally understand. And last up, let's go over the mana base. So I am fortunate. I have a ton of um, expensive shock lands and other lands uh, just in my collection. So my mana base is pretty expensive. I'm not playing fetch lands, but um, the mana base is probably one of the more expensive parts of the deck. I think the deck still works really well, even if you're playing tap lands. The, the deck has such a high curve and it's playing a lot of mana rocks that it's okay to spend the first couple of turns just playing tap lands. But so I'm playing Shivan Reef, Godless Shrine, Concealed Courtyard, Caves of Koilos, Mystic Monastery, Hollowed Fountain, Sacred Foundry, Drowned Catacomb, Battlefield Forge, Choked Estuary, Sea of Clouds, Inspiring Vantage, Command Tower, Port Town, Arcane Sanctum, Smoldering Marsh, Exotic Orchard, Glacial Fortress, Sunken Hollow, Watery Grave. And then for basics, I'm playing four swamps, five islands, three mountains, and three planes. The deck is primarily blue, so there are a lot more blue sources in the deck than anything else, and then white and red and black are pretty much tied, so blue is the most important color in the deck. And then I'm playing Inventor's Fair. It's a super powerful land. Uh, at the beginning of our upkeep, if we control at least three artifacts, we're going to gain a life. It can tap for a colorless, enters untapped. We can also pay four mana, tap it, and sacrifice it to search our library for any artifact and put it into our hand. We can only activate this if we control at least three artifacts, but again, it's not difficult in our deck. I mean, we cast Brea and we already have three artifacts right there. So that's super easy. 
And so yeah, that's the end of the list. Thank you guys so much for making it to this point. Thank you so much for bearing with me as I go over this somewhat complicated deck. Artifact decks tend to be a little complicated because they usually have a ton of combos and a ton of complicated interaction within themselves, but I think that's what makes artifacts really appealing too, is they do really cool things and they have so much synergy with, with themselves and they're usually all colorless, so it's it's really cool. I love artifacts and I've really loved playing this deck and I hope you enjoy playing it too. Again, thank you guys so much and if you like our content, don't forget to subscribe. It's a super easy, quick way of supporting the channel and it really does help us and we appreciate you guys and we appreciate the community and you won't miss our future deck techs and our future gameplay videos. Again, thank you guys so much and have an awesome day.